I'll go ahead and start it if people can. Um, hello, everyone. Hi. Okay. We're getting things set up. Bear with, bear with us with technological technolo technology. Okay. And we'll kind of wait as people tune in. And I'm syncing this to go live on Facebook as well. So people can watch via Facebook. I may have to and then we'll get the conversation started in just a minute. So our first Channing has been doing a lot of um, recent Zoom lives, all sorts of press things that are all happening virtually. This is my first, my first. So we're um, we're just getting getting it all set up. But she's definitely more a veteran. Oh no, we're in this together. <laughs> <laughs> we're in all the everyone's adapting to virtual um, virtual everything. So we're would love would love to be in the Kimballs together, but <laughs> oh no, I know. Ideally, this would be happening in the Kimball. Um, okay, and we've got people joining. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Okay, so great to see everyone here, but even though we can't see you, but you can see us. Um, okay, we should be live on Facebook. And if not, I will have a coworker let me know. Um, Okay, hello everyone. So now that more people have joined, I did want to, before um, Channing talks a little bit about herself and her work, I want, did want to give just an introduction a little bit to um, this event, the Artist's Eye, which this is the first time the Artist's Eye has happened virtually because of the world we're all in at the moment. Um, but I wanted to give an intro to the Artist's Eye for anyone who, um, there may be people watching who have been to this event before in the Kimball um, because we always do it in the galleries, um, but we're not able to do that. But um, the Artist's Eye program has been a long-standing Kimball program since 1982. So it has been um, around for a while. And as maybe a lot of our viewers know, the Kimball here in Fort Worth collects antiquities, European, Asian art, European art, Asian art, um, African art, and art from the ancient Americas. Um, and our collection, uh, we don't collect American art because we leave that to our neighbors, the Amon Carter, and we don't collect contemporary art or post about 1945 because we leave that to our other neighbors, um, the modern next to us. So these three museums kind of cover cover a lot of um, area. And because we don't collect contemporary art, one of the ways we like to engage with living artists is by inviting them to this event, the Artist's Eye um, program. And so this program gives the opportunity for um, our members and any visitors to um, Kind of hear from a contemporary working artist um, and to hear them speak about the Kimball collection, some works in the collection through their eyes and share um, their own experiences. And so we've had over the years many different artists from painters, sculptors, architects. We've had um, a poet before, um, but Channing is our very first filmmaker we've ever had. So thank you for being our first, our first filmmaker. Wow, and, um, I'm honored. <laughs> I, yeah, we're honored to have you. So our first filmmaker, and um, we're happy, so happy to have you here. And I did want to tell people from the start, please do ask questions throughout. So the Zoom, this Zoom webinar has a Q and A feature. So please ask questions throughout, and I'm going to be um monitoring those and looking at them and you can also ask questions if you're watching on facebook 
via Facebook as well. And um, Channing and I will definitely leave time for questions. You can ask them to Channing directly and I'll read them or about our collection, anything, anything you want. So please ask questions throughout. Um, and I don't know, I think that was kind of it as far as introducing the artist side to anyone who's not familiar. Um, but Channing, why don't we start with showing the trailer for Miss Juneteenth? Great. Does that sound good? So Channing film is filmmaker from Fort Worth, born and raised. Yes, born and raised. <laughs> okay. And well, why don't you say really quickly just um, a little bit about, so one of the reasons we wanted to have an invited Channing to be here and speak is because it is super exciting. You are from Fort Worth, um, know of the Kimball and um, you are back here too right now, especially spending time here because of COVID and reasons like that. But um, very exciting because of Miss Juneteenth, this film that came out very recently. Um, so why don't you, if you want to just brief little introduction to Miss Juneteenth and then I'll show the trailer. Some attendees to this maybe have already watched the film. I hope some of you all have watched the film. If not, that is going to be imperative for you all after this panel. But yes, so say a little bit about the film and then we'll show the trailer. That's right. Miss Juneteenth is required viewing after you've been yeah. to this panel. <laughs> Please, um, required. Well, Miss Juneteenth is a film, um, you know, and I'll, I'll speak really quickly because I know we want to get to the the trailer but it's a film I feel like that I've been conceiving of my entire life I'm um, as you mentioned I was born and raised in Fort Worth and um, I grew up um, on the south side of Fort Worth Texas um, and it just you know became something that was you know it's so important to me like my upbringing and I noticed um, some things that the people on this particular part of town had in common and there was a sense of determination and grit about them and they carried themselves with grace and I realized now you know there was early inspirations in my work because my stories tend to originate there you know I've been inspired by many folks, you know, on this particular side of town. And, um, you know, I, I think especially like Fort Worth has a, you know, it's almost a character in my, my films. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to show in Miss Juneteenth in particular, you know, um, this is a this is a side of town in which there are some really some businesses that have legacy they're like legacy businesses that are passed down but I, I can talk more about that as we go on you know I know that that's a longer discussion but the film I'll tell you is about um, a woman named Turquoise who is a former beauty queen she's now you know at the time of our story a heart she's turned she's now a hard-working single mother and she's preparing her rebellious teenage daughter for the Miss Juneteenth pageant and she's hoping to keep her from repeating her same mistakes and um, if you want to run the trailer we can also talk a little bit more later about you know what the Miss Juneteenth pageant is you know I'm talking to the hometown crowd yes. so, you know I probably don't have to give as many details on what that is but I'm excited for you all to see um, the way I was able to bring it to screen yes okay great thank you for that and yes I hope I'm sure a lot of this is hometown crowd um, watching. So let me pull up the trailer. Thank you all for bearing with me with. Um, okay, and then we'll. Hope everyone can see that. I will never get over seeing Miss Juneteenth cleaning toilets. <laughs> <laughs> the winner of Miss Juneteenth will receive a full scholarship to any historically black institution of your choice. Good luck. I know that you are looking to replicate your success. What's her problem? I beat her. When we get the new place, we can bring it on more regular. I hate to see you working so hard. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. Oh, I have the rest of the money. We don't do credit. We don't do layaway. <laughs> you got something for her account? You know I can't carry that kind of money on me, girl. I'm be right by y'all this time. I've been holding down a long time right here. 
She my dream now. I'ma make sure that she's something that we ain't. If I make the dance team, I can get me a scholarship. Now you have my daughter out there dancing like that. No Ain't no school handing out a full ride for that. You better hope your grades turn out right. Where's your homework? You worry about the wrong thing. I need you to focus on your studies. Miss Juneteenth is here to prepare you for the future. Your dinner night. That is your salad night. One would surely not eat the main course with that. We are expecting greatness. Why are you making me do it? Didn't do nothing for you. So get up and clap your hands. But not ever see you at my house again. You always embarrass me. I'm not cute. <laughs> or built to suit a fashion model size. <laughs> That's my baby. Phenomenal woman. That's me. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, okay. So that was great to watch again. Um, so we, so I wanted to show that in case also, you know, some people who are watching have not seen the film yet to just give you, give them a taste of your work. Um, and this is your first feature film, which is also incredible because, um, which maybe some people know it has been getting all sorts of press. The press is very exciting um, around this film. And it was released on Juneteenth of this year, right? Yes, uh -huh. yes. The US release was um, June 19th of this year on Juneteenth, which was really special. And then we actually released yesterday in the UK and Ireland. So, you yeah. know, feel really lucky about that. Yeah. Well. And I'm sure making I'm Fort Worth proud and this community proud because it has been getting um, national acclaim, incredible reviews, and one already an article saying it's an Oscar contender. So all very, very exciting um, news for you. And just sample of your work. And again, people need to watch it as well. But I um, wanted to start with that. And then I wanted to pull up, I'll go ahead and pull up our some slides that um, put together with Channing of our current collection um, installation as well. So let me do that. And someone's asking about where to, where can I see the film today? Um, it's on video on demand and digital, so places like Amazon and Apple. Yes. yes. Um, it was in virtual cinemas, but I think it's leaving many of them now. So those are the two places that I can think of really quickly. Okay. And yes, we filmed it here in Fort Worth. All filmed here in Fort Worth. <laughs> okay, so pulling up um, PowerPoint. Hope everyone can see that. Um, yes, the film's on Amazon, all of that. So yes, um, definitely watch it. So I wanted to, so Channing um, was able, I kind of have showed her a virtual walkthrough of our current installation here at the Kimball. Um, and so this event, so getting a taste of her work and we'll talk about her practice as a filmmaker and then relating that to um, objects in our collection. And so that, and our current installation right now is a very, I'm, I'm personally am really loving it. And it's been a, exciting to see the different connections being made in the gallery, galleries right now. Um, our current installation is all in our con building at the moment. Um, and it is integrated. So our um, curators, George Shackelford, Jennifer Kassler Price, they um, worked a lot on this current installation to integrate um, objects from our Asian African collection and um, ancient American collections with our European collection. So it's a really um, interesting conversations happening in the galleries right now between objects, which even in this image here, um, I'm sure you all can see with our Pierre Bernard in the background. And then we have this um, wonderful um, ancestral warrior figure in the foreground, which is one of our African objects. Um, and so that is an example. And then I'm gonna um, go to our, so this image as well, also of the current installation. And Channing and I will be talking specifically about this wonderful um, kneeling mother and child from, um, which is another African object from the Makonde people in Africa. And so that is a wonderful, object we'll be talking about this juxtaposition um, and you all can see here the juxtaposition in the galleries already 
um, with this Makande woman in the foreground and in the background. Um, we have some incredible Madonna and Child, um, especially these Italian Renaissance examples of the Madonna and Child in our collection um, in the background. So I'm loving this, these themes of motherhood already happening. And so we'll touch on that as well. Um, but Channing, was there anything after now the trailer, um, if you wanted to kind of talk a little bit more about um, your practice as a filmmaker and what you're inspired by visually. Um, and I think for me personally, watching Miss Juneteenth already, just the film visually itself is stunning. And I think the cinematography, the colors, the, um, the locations, everything is just, it's a beautiful film um, aesthetically in every way. Um, so talking even just about you as a filmmaker, what you are aesthetically inspired by, what you look to for visual inspiration um, in your life and practice. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I think as a filmmaker and as a human being, I'm always, you know, searching for the truth. And so authenticity is probably, um, for me, the most important part of my work. Mm -hmm. And um, also, I think as a director, I have this very naturalistic approach um, in that, you know, I, I think you find it in the acting, you know, you find it in me wanting to capture the environment as authentically as possible. Um, in this particular community, it was a community that I knew so well, obviously, you know, because it was a community that I grew up in. And so, you know, it, I think it was both of a, both a blessing and a curse because I wanted to like portray it as accurately as possible. And even in writing the script, there's so much of the world that I wanted to show mm -hmm. just because I knew the world so intimately. And um, at some point, you know, you realize as a filmmaker that you can't like, <laughs> you can't have every single aspect of the world in it, especially when you're navigating this, you know, the central character's journey mm -hmm. and you have to be in service of her journey. But I tried to get as much of the world in as I could and I always try to um, layer storytelling in every single aspect of the filmmaking. And that's in the cinematography that you've talked about. Um, that's in the production design and the, the costume design and, you know, even their, their hair is telling a story in this film. So, you know, it's important for me to try to do that. And I think that's because um, I really was um, into literature growing up and I really loved like the stories of like Toni Morrison and Alice Walker, you know, um, and all these different literary greats that were telling stories, especially about um, really complex stories about Black women and their journeys. And I think it was very inspirational for me. I mean, I think another thing that was inspirational for me, and, you know, maybe some people will remember this, but when I was growing up, there was a um, small theater on the south side of Fort Worth called Sojourner Truth that my family was very, very active in. And I remember my mom, um, taking us there and just being blown away um, by theater. And I was able to see early on like really, you know, complex stories about Black people. And I, I just, you know, I fell in love with these Black plays, you know, like Pearly and For Color Girls. And it was just really moving, you know, to think that I got to see those, those plays as a kid, you know, those works as a child, because it definitely had an impact on me as an adult and like the career path that I wanted to take. Um, stop me anytime if I'm talking too no, much. I'm trying I, to answer all your questions. <laughs> I don't know, and I think that's a wonderful, just to give some background to what you were thinking about in your work mm -hmm. and the influence, which um, we've talked about, of um, community and um, these themes of legacy and ancestry and what you were mm -hmm. um, especially with the representation of black women, um, especially in this film and that being, and again, your first feature link film where you wanted that to be um, highlighted. And I think, and maybe we can kind of, um, and so I love this image so much and all of these photos I wanted to, um, they are taken by a wonderful Fort Worth photographer, Rambo, who some of you all may know watching, but mm -hmm. so all of the photos you'll see in this slide presentation are taken by her. Um, and they're just lovely. And this one, um, 
is one of my favorites, especially because one of the things you and I talked about um, quite a bit that will relate to this wonderful, um, and I love this image as well, but the wonderful um, kneeling mother and child, this um, object here on view in our collection um, is this, is the story of motherhood in Miss Juneteenth. And, um, and I would love for you to start by talking about that more and then kind of why this object is meaningful to in our collection and um, it being um, an African representation. But um, could you talk a little bit more about um, Turquoise and Kai's relationship in the film, Motherhood, and you being a recent mother yourself while um, writing and directing this film. Um, so yeah, talking about, let's start there. Um, there's a lot here mother motherhood yeah um, I see a question from George to yeah. just asking about um, kind of my journey and how motherhood affected my work um, you know I knew that I wanted to tell this story um, about a, a mother and daughter and both were navigating their own dreams and their ideas for themselves um, I had an interesting vantage point, you know, in watching my mother, you know, raising children and navigating her own dreams when I was growing up. Um, my mom was also a single mom. She'd been single for much of my life, um, but she was also this force, you know. And so I literally, when in, in writing the film, you know, that informed like much of that mother daughter journey. Um, I really was, it was always in turquoise, the lead character's perspective, but I'd written it as a daughter, really, you know, and then like right around the time, I think um, I found out I was going to be able to make the film. Um, uh, I found out that I was going to become a mother myself wow. <laughs> and coincidentally had a daughter and it really changed me. Um, I, I realized that I was experiencing two emotions right away. Like I had this instant joy, you know, when I saw this little human being and, you know, just wanted to instantly like hold her close and never let her go. Um, but I also experienced this fear right away because I was like, oh, wow, this is real. You know, I'm responsible for this little child's life, you know, for, for as long as I'm here, you know, to make sure she has the best life. And so I was honestly, you know, experiencing many of Turquoise's emotions that she experiences in the film in real time, you know, and I think um, it was also, it also changed, I think, the way um, the film, you know, it, it changed and morphed the film in so many ways, because I've heard it described as like delicate, you know, um, it, it, sensitive, those kind of things, and I know that my daughter had a big impact on that because like I was literally experiencing the joy of her being alive. And I just remember, you know, jumping into scenes with the actors and being like, no matter what we have to, um, we have to, you know, bring the joy to these scenes. And that was really from her being here. So um, shout out to my baby girl. <laughs> shout out to her, yes. And was she on, um, during filming, was she on set with you often? She was absolutely on set the entire time. Like she turned one on set, bless her. Wow. Um, she gave up her first birthday to Miss <laughs> Um yeah. But yeah, she was there and that was important for me because she was so small and I just, I, you know, physically did not want to be away from my daughter, you know, and we were very, very close. And um, I was grateful that she was there. Like Rambo took some lovely photos of us together that I'll forever cherish, you know. Yeah. And I'll be able to show her when she gets older. <laughs> yes. And then just again, like you're saying, this impact she had on the way that you decided to approach Turquoise and Kai's relationship even more as you were filming. And I, so I loved this photo. And then I loved, you had, there were so many great photos, but also this, um, so what you were just talking about, and then I want to bring that to this, um, to the Makande, which I'm going to, um, here she is again. Let me show a few different images of her. If you all have not seen this object in the galleries, it's been also special for me to just look at it more closely the past um, few weeks. Uh, but I love what you were just talking about this. And one, so turquoise in the film, this, you know, she is incredibly, she's loving and tender with Kai. And then there are these moments where she is working 
working so hard and supporting her daughter and this um this that kind of tension in motherhood and i love this um also picturing you with your daughter on set but this kneeling mother and um let me go back so if you all can see on these images and i'll go to our um i can go to our website as well and look a little closer but you'll see the um baby in a sling on the back of the mother um carrying her which is you know the traditional way of carrying the child and then her hands are still free in front and so this idea of this um, and you were saying earlier to me, you've been doing that with your daughter. Literally, she's been on your back and you've been carrying her around uh, the house often. But um, the tenderness and care and protectiveness of this imagery and with mother and that idea of motherhood, but then the tension of two, um, what's required of her in working and for turquoise, especially in the film, um, a lot is required of her and demanded from her that she's Yes, this is such a, um, you know, strong, this resonated with me because it, it, it is such a strong work because, you know, you literally see a mother like with the, her child on her back, but she's continuing to find a way to work. Mm -hmm. And that was always, you know, a factor for me. I think right around the time I found out I was going to have my daughter obviously say, you know, I found out I was going to be able to make the film. And it's like, there are these there's this decision all of a sudden it's like I've got to keep moving forward you know um as a person who has been working you know in this in the arts for a long time and you know you see these opportunities happen and so I need to go ahead and um, make this opportunity happen not only for myself now but um for her future as well and um you know turquoise is navigating many of these things in the film you know she has this dream that at one time was an individual dream for herself um and it's a dream that you know in the film is been deferred but it's not been denied ultimately but she has to make a decision to find a way to reconcile that dream so like when i see this piece of work it speaks to me because it says you know that we find a way with our children to keep moving forward and we find a way, you know, to provide for them and to like keep them close at the same time. And that meant so much to me because that that was what I had to find a way to do on Miss Juneteenth, you know. Um, I was like, I wanted my daughter close to me, but I also had to find a way to, you know, keep her safe at the same time. Mm, yes, exactly. And I think, um... I can see why this piece would be meaningful in that way and the way that you, and I'm not a mother myself, but the way that you depict motherhood and show this kind of, often it seems like impossible um, tasks that mothers are required of. And I think too here, I loved, so one of the, you know, neat things in our gallery right now is this juxtaposition where we have behind this Makande mother um, these three images of the Madonna and child, Italian Renaissance images, and um, which are, you know, religious images showing a divine kind of motherly relationship. Um, and I just love that the Makande also being very real and relatable, yet also in her own way having divine qualities because of that realness and relatability with the reality of that tension and the work and the hard work and then the child being this protecting force um and the images in the background kind of highlight that for me in this object um mm -hmm. that she and herself kind of has these divine qualities that you know the virgin mary often in these images has um so it made me look at it in a new way in that and how the motherhood that idea of culturally motherhood and images of mothers just trans transcend every culture and their images of um we can all think of the mothers in every culture um everything so yeah um, totally and, and that's what i think you know the film is very specific to this particular you know community and you know growing up as a black woman in this community and um you know, people have asked, you know, what, 
people from other cultures can like take from the film and you know we've released now as i mentioned earlier in the uk and ireland and people are really connecting to you know many of the themes that are universal to us all and you know one of the strong themes that runs throughout really is you know mother and child and that's why this um sculpture really spoke to me mm -hmm. um also, I just, and when you talk about it, you know, divine, like when I looked at it, I was like, you know, it, this, it really does feel divine because there's a divine connection that I couldn't even explain in becoming a, a mother, you know, with my daughter. And so um, as soon as I saw it, you remember, I was just like, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. definitely this is the one we should discuss. Yes, because it is so, it says all of that. And I think it also, it touches on, and someone in the Carolyn and the attendees said my audio is breaking up. So if you all cannot hear me, do let me know. Um, I'm not sure what I'll, but hopefully you all can hear me. Okay. Um, they said they can hear you chanting. So I'm not, I don't know what's happening on my end, but um, uh, I think also this object. So you were talking too about um, female form, female representation. So especially you know, black women in, in America, but female form and how you think about that in your film. And um, so this object also as well, I think thinking also juxtapositions, but looking at the female form in African objects and I think form in general, we have, um, hold on, I wanna, let me scroll forward. So I just love these of her kneeling and her body and then her face the structure of her body. And so I, I don't know if talking about this um, idea of female form and African indigenous culture, and if you've looked at any kind of in thinking about the women in your films and representing these women, um, what you've kind of looked to and thought about in female representation in that way. I don't know if that, does that make sense? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, really, um representation has always been you know so important like I was mention mentioning earlier that like um, I was really into literature especially by you know these literary greats that happen to be black women you know and so I had a different appreciation like um, I missed seeing that representation in cinema but I didn't feel a void in particular because I found it in literature but I think in doing that you know I would visually like see pictures in my head and I wanted to find a way to bring that to cinema I think in Miss Juneteenth in particular in the pageant itself it's a pageant that really is focused on um representing young black women and so you know whereas you have a, a typical beauty pageant is focused on this like European standard of beauty. Miss Juneteenth really celebrates these young black women in all their different shades and all the different hair textures and all their different shapes and sizes. And that's one thing that I can really, really appreciate. Um, and so we're seeing some of that in this particular mother and child sculpture in celebrating like the African form in a different way. And so um, that's another reason that I really thought, felt it was lovely. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I agree. And I think, um, and also to just this image, thinking again of the um, color quality, and we have, and I loved this, Allison Green asked, I loved this juxtaposition, the colors even in Montaigne. So this is Andrea Montaigne's painting in the background, which is an Italian Renaissance work. And she was saying the um, richness of the color, richness of the color and quality of light in that film is very, she said, could be related to your work. And I did love that even in this image here, the richness and color, which you um, brought in this film made such, I just, added to such depth of viewing, I think, the people and their story. Um, and I don't know, can you speak to just color choices? How you even... Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's another thing I was talking about. That's, that's why my opening statement was just like authenticity is like the most important thing for me as a filmmaker. And um, I wanted to bring the sense of richness of color that I felt in being in the actual world to the film. And so um, I had this really lovely um, 
cinematographer named Daniel Patterson, who, um, you know, he's worked on like um, Spike Lee's show, She's Gotta Have It. Um, he shot another Spike Lee movie um, recently. And he's just, um, I saw his work and I was like, there's a poetry to his work. And I love the way that he's able to, um, you know, shoot black people in a way that they're just stunning on screen. And so um, when I sat down with him, you know, the first thing was like, let's go in the world and we can see the world. And I want to feel that sense of color in the world. Um, another, you were talking about visual inspirations earlier, but um, I was also inspired by like, um, you know, different mediums like Gordon Parks, you know, is like this incredible photographer who has a series called um, the Segregation Series. And it, there's just really beautiful like color throughout those photos. And um, those were an example, you know, that I used, I also used, you know, pulled visual examples from everywhere mm -hmm. and um, was able to kind of center it and say, you know, we definitely want the world to feel as colorful as I felt being in it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Yes, yes. And that too, relating to just, um, which you and I have talked about also, but um, place and community being so important, which again, I think we have a lot of Fort, Worth, Fort Worthians watching, um, but place and community being so important, I think probably a lot of people can um, feel that. I mean, even driving around historic Southside or just what you, that sense of place that you create, um, and then bring visually into the film and then add to it with color and texture and this warmth, but then also kind of hearkening back to images like that Gordon Parks has taken or other, oh, I love this image so much, but in the, um, that sense of community. Yeah, when you talk about like, um, you know, kind of texture, like I definitely, I talked about earlier, like one thing that I found that the people in, the, in this particular community have in common is that sense of determination. And, you know, I describe it as a grit. And that's the way that I also talked about it with my cinematographer. I was like, I want it, I want to feel a sense of like grit, you know, in the film, like literally everything that is informing the film is about, um, what I am taking from like being in the spaces, you know, that's the way, like I, I literally, you know, my, I, I got my, I got my start really as an actor and believe that that was the career for me. So like literally I approach everything from inside out, you know, I'll have to kind of walk through the space. I'll have to walk through the characters. This is even in the writing and the film and the directing everything. Um, and that informs um, the way the film uh, ends up looking, that informs the way the film ends up feeling. And so it was just important to me to be able to kind of capture that sense of grit. Yes, yeah, which I, do, I the grit is such a good word. Um, oh, I wanted, so we've kind of, I've jumped ahead. Let me see. <laughs> Let me put it. Um, the sense of grit, um, that quality and yeah, I love that. Um, okay, I wanted to, to, unless there was more about, we could, I feel like there was so much we were talking about with um, motherhood and that idea, but, and the, that, the divine qualities of that. But I also wanted to, we had talked a little bit about um, this warrior ancestor figure here um, in the front and I could pull up, do I have on our website? Let me see. Oops, sorry, you all, my screen's lagging a bit. But anyway, this this object here, this warrior ancestor figure from our African collection um, is also really incredible. And I wanted, looking at its um, qualities, even just the, the wood qualities in comparison to the Makande figure, but this idea of determination, strength, steadfastness seen in this diff this other object um, and it's more kind of abstracted features the um, the qualities in the wood that are obviously just um, over time it's being seen but there's kind of this poignancy about this object and its tarnishness and um, I wanted to speak a little bit about it, and it's kind of speaking to this theme of which you've touched on but of ancestry and legacy 
in Miss Juneteenth and this being um, an important kind of honoring of an ancestral figure in African culture and this object representing that. And for you honoring ancestry and legacy in this film and looking to that in African culture and African American culture, could you speak a little bit to that um, and this idea of ancestry that we talked about? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, thematically, um, Juneteenth is looking at, um, you know, how the past, you know, dictates our futures and what we choose to leave behind and what we choose to take, you know, moving forward. And so the ancestors were not only an inspiration for the film, but, you know, such a big part of the film. And, and I was, you know, discussing Juneteenth itself, you know, and for, I know that we're talking to a Fort Worth crowd, but for anyone who's unfamiliar, you know, um, Juneteenth is the day um, that we commemorate um, in our community the fact that the enslaved people in Texas didn't find out they were free until two and a half years after everyone else. So they didn't find out they were free until two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And um, we commemorate that with, um, you know, a parade and there's mm -hmm. I can remember blues music and barbecue and dance, you know, and yeah. people really coming together. And as a kid, for me, you know, it was about more about the pomp and circumstance of that day. But mm -hmm. as I um, became an adult, I started to understand it in a different way that it was really about commemorating our ancestors um, and and really recognizing and having reverence for what they experienced and having their freedom like intentionally kept from them. Yeah. And um, the centerpiece of that is obviously the Miss Juneteenth pageant. And that was always really formative for me because, you know, I was talking about representation earlier. And as a young black girl growing up in Fort Worth, Texas, I got to go to a, you know, actual a pageant where you have all these you know beautiful young black women yes. like here mm -hmm. um, that looked like me so it gave me a sense of confidence and um i i just realized now that that's why it was it resonated with me so strongly and it's something that i wanted to tell a story about all these you know years later mm -hmm. um i also have to shout out um opalie who's the queen of um Fort Worth, <laughs> but, but especially the Queen of Juneteenth, you know, she's this wonderful woman who has kept it alive and, um, you know, was such a big part of my childhood and also as a part of my adulthood and um, was a big part of why I was able to make this film as well. Um, she's just yeah. a lovely woman. So when you talk about the ancestors, you know, I think that they still, um, you know, for me are here in so many ways. And I wanted to, you know, have a sense of that in Miss Juneteenth and them informing the film. Yeah. And I think you just said something about Opalie too, which I love that this idea of keeping um, legacy and tradition alive is another thing that I think is culturally transcendent and how even looking at these objects again, how that's something throughout history has been done with just the creation of objects. This idea that we are going to put our identity, cultural identity and um, honor our ancestry and legacy through objects and through imagery of our people mm -hmm. and what that looks like and means. And that's what, I mean, that's what Miss Juneteenth is doing, which is, I think, again, adding to the just power of this film for this community and for, um, well, communities everywhere, but that I think a lot of people could look to and relate to. Um, and I wanted to show, oh, I love this image of um, Kai too so much because even thinking about her character in the film and we had talked about this earlier again with that idea of motherhood but that tension of the mother being this protector overseer and then Turquoise having this idea of what she wants to carry on in legacy and um, Kai then also coming into that but then trying to find her own authentic voice in it um mm -hmm. and i don't know if you could speak a little bit but how she adapted her own mother's could you talk a little bit about that in the film i loved that um 
how she adapted what her mother did in the pageant. Yeah, you know, um, I don't want to give away too much because I know some people have. <laughs> Wait, I know. Maybe that is giving away too much. Um, but, but I do, you know, Kai is, you know, for me, she was representative of, you know, this idea that I feel like, um, you know, especially, you know, we're navigating like so many tragedies right now in the Black community. And, you know, there's always a question of what it means to survive as a Black person in America. And um, I don't even know if we're at the point in which we could have conversations about what it means to thrive yet, because we're still navigating our, our, our own survival, you know. And um, I really wanted to be able to have a conversation about, you know, what it means for Kai to really be able to have a sense of, um, of being carefree as a kid, you know, like what is her like dream in the world and how can she connect to that dream and be able to find an individual way to interpret that dream, you know, and she's also navigating her mom's expectations and her mom's expectations are based on um, Turquoise's own dream that she had at one time that didn't work out in the way she expected it to and so she's trying to find a way to solidify Kai's future you know there's also you know a sense of um, being able to create a future that she feels Kai is um, in which she's safe you know because often you know we're we're in a society in which, you know, we're navigating Black women and girls' abilities to feel safe in our society. You know, we just had um, the Breonna Taylor verdict come down. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the Breonna Taylor, you know, this discussion about whether um, she would get justice. And so, you know, these themes are coming up in my work consistently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just what it means to navigate, you know, life in this country as a Black woman and, or girl. Yeah, no, thank you. That, yes, exactly. And I think that her character is very um, moving in that way, what you're saying, um, and her trying to find her own voice um, as well, but yet in such still intention often. Um, and I loved, and I think that too, um, again, the why this film is important, but that legacy that's left with visual art that you're leaving and that is important in these objects as well um, to be able to look at and see and um, even relate from very different time periods, <laughs> um, relate to. Um, I wanted to also, I mean, we are, Oh, wow, it's already um, 1147. So I'd love to uh, leave some time for some questions if we have some coming in from anywhere. And one thing, well, Karen Myers did ask, did you spend time in the Kimball growing up? Um, and she said, how can museums engage young people with their collection? Oh, I would love to hear you speak about that. Um you know, I have not, I, and, and I mentioned to you, I did, I, I remember, you know, being in the Kimball as a child, mm -hmm. I remember class trips and things like that, and I was excited to be able to return as an adult, and unfortunately, we're all, you know, separate right now, so I look forward to going to the Kimball again, but I have to shout out Catherine, because she's just been so lovely in making sure that I was able to engage with the collection um, so I'm really thankful for that. And, you know, there were some pieces that, you know, instantly I was moved by right away. And um, I, I thank you for that. Of course, no, thank you. We didn't get to this one, but I, I'm grateful too that you could, even in our virtual world right now, that you could um, revisit the collection like you are. Um, and another, we have another question. If you could elaborate on um, Opal Lee a bit and her inspiration for the film or in the film. Oh yeah, I could talk oh. about it forever. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm sure you could, but we all, yes. Yeah, it, and you all should see the film if you haven't because she has a cameo in the film, which I feel really lucky <laughs> to have been able to capture that. But um, she's definitely, when we talk about, um, you know, what it means to be a warrior and like, you know, we're talking about this warrior ancestor, ancestor figure, you know, 
Um, thankfully, she is um, she is a living warrior in here with us. But like, she's one person in particular that when I talk about you know what's inspired, I think the turquoise character is you know women that I saw growing up who were determined, and I talked about them carrying themselves with a sense of grace. You know, that was inspired by like my mother and grandmother and aunts and women in the community, and she's one of those central women in the community that I reference. Yeah. Because she, um, you know, I can remember one of the things that, you know, is poignantly like sticking out in my head right now is, you know, every Juneteenth parade, Miss um, Opal Lee walks, you know, I, I don't know if it's like two miles or what it is, but she's out there walking, making the rest of us look like, you know. <laughs> and how old is she now? Did you just go work out? I don't want, I don't want to miss. I, I don't want to see the event. I well, did. Age, but it does, but it, yeah. You know, 90 plus, I think. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, Miss Opal Lee, if I don't know right on the, the dot. I'm just, you know, when I start thinking about you, I get overwhelmed and this, the details just go out the window. But she's, um, she's just such a lovely woman. And when I went to her and said, I want to um, make this film, she said, absolutely. And then she put... Um, me and my husband, who's my creative partner, she put us both to work. So yes, that is, yes, I love it. That's so good. Um, Someone says she's ageless. So she is yeah. ageless. Yes, thank you, Lori. Yes, she, is she, she is, and she's a, she's a treasure. And yeah, we're you know grateful to um, you know be among her at this point. So thank you. Yes. Um, and we have another question from Catherine Morris that do you anticipate black motherhood being an ongoing theme in your future projects? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we were talking earlier about legacy is definitely um, legacy is important to me. Um, you know, you can see that in even in the businesses that are in Miss Juneteenth, you know, their bus legacy businesses that are passed down. So just like black motherhood, you know, um, black womanhood, legacy, um, grief is all, always turns up in my work in some way, um, family relationship, you know, in the South, we call things, we, we call this generational curse, you know, and I was talking about earlier, what we choose to leave behind and what we choose to take forward, that shows up quite a bit, um, so yes, I will be taking that on. <laughs> yes. No, definitely. And I think, and on that note, if, continuing to take that on, but can you speak a little bit at all about what's coming up for you and what you're working on at the moment or in that's in the works? Yeah, you? definitely. Um, I, I'm, you know, my next original, I can't kind of talk about plot and things like that because I'm still in process. And that's always like a, you know, sensitive place for me. But um I'm definitely um, working on my next original film. You know, there's some uh, television ideas that I have in the works as well. And I also, I'm just kind of, you know, partnering with other folks right now um, as far as like directing opportunities and things like that. But, you know, this is a world that I love so dearly, you know, like growing up on the South side of Fort Worth, which, you know, I know, I know they now call the historic South side of Fort Worth, <laughs> but um it's a world that I consistently thought, you know, should be shown on film. And um, I want to continue to like show these really specific worlds, um, you know, especially with Black women on their journeys. Yeah. Yes. And is there something, so on that, with you thinking about this community that you care a lot about and the arts in this community, are there things you think about or hope for with different communities engaging with the visual arts? In I mean, I love that question. And I don't think that, I'm trying to think that I've been asked it before, you know, I hope that there are um, more, you know, I grew up as a young black woman in Fort Worth, Texas. And, you know, I didn't know if, you know, I didn't even think of like cinema being an option for me. There really wasn't an infrastructure for it. And especially not for, you know, um, me. And so, you know, if there's other young women that can see a path into storytelling, like, I definitely would love to see that come into fruition. So I just want to see more. Um, I think, you know, the, I think the more stories that we have being told from the more, um, from different perspectives, other than, you know, the ones that we're used to, we can, 
hear each other better. You know, mm -hmm. we're able to have more human stories that are able to be told and we're able to connect with each other in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why, you know, it's important, which is your, your films paving the way um, in a lot of ways for that and for, and it's why looking at that art is important. And I think, and I appreciate you looking at objects in our collection that I think have helped me think more about the cultures and people of the ancestor warrior that we looked at in the Makande um, mother and child, because it's important to look at those objects too in our, still look at objects in our time now and look at those that are from different times and see how they can even um, speak to stories that you're telling in your work. So thank you for that and looking at them. Yeah, this was so, this is so yes. wonderful. And I don't know if we have um, other questions at the moment, but thank you all for watching. It's already been an hour. <laughs> so there you go. Um, thank you, Channing. And we're excited to see what you do next. And hopefully we can have you actually come and be in the galleries with us um, at some point um, in person, which would be great. Um, and I did want to tell people before we turn off that we do have another artist eye coming up on November 7th with a Dallas-based artist, Linda Ridgeway. And that will also be happening virtually. So Channing and I were the uh, first ones to try this virtual and we really <laughs> Thank you for everything. And Thank you all for being here. This is so wonderful. I wish I could see everybody's faces. But and just wonderful to have a Fort Worthian um, speak about and just, yeah, your film here and everything. So we thank you for your work. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.